Hey everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the first talk of the day. All about Astro by Professor Shomak Rai Chaudhary. Dr. Shomak Rai Chaudhary is the director of the Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune. He graduated from Presidency College, University of Calcutta, with further studies at the University of Oxford, UK. After his PhD from the University of Cambridge, UK, he worked at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, USA, where he was also part of the team that built the Chandra X-ray Observatory for NASA. After teaching for over a decade at the University of Birmingham, UK, he returned to India as Head of Physics and Dean of Sciences at Presidency University, Kolkata, before he became director of IUCAA. Dr. Rai Chaudhary is a fellow of the National Academic Academy of Sciences and chair of the LIGO India Science Management Board and TMT India Project Management Board. His research involves a wide range of topics in cosmology and astrophysics from the ground and from space. Today, Professor Shomak will be giving an introduction to basics of astronomy through colors and magnitudes, stellar evolution, and a lot more. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the live Q&A section available to you. We will try to take up most of the queries during the Q&A session, which will be held at the very end of the talk. Without further ado, I will hand over the session to Professor Shomak. Great, hi. Um, can I uh, share my screen now? Yes, please. Good. Let me do that. Is the screen visible? It's visible okay. now. Great, wonderful. Um, good morning. Very early morning for many of you. I, uh, um, I'm, my name is Shumak Rai and I've been asked to um, start off this whole um, exercise all about astro and um, and give uh, an introductory lecture on the basics of astronomy. So I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, um, uh, most of you um, have not encountered um, basics of astronomy before. And, and so if uh, the, there's familiar material here, then please bear with me. Um, this is uh, essentially to prepare you for what's coming in, in this in this whole game. So, um, first of all, I you know like to say that as an astronomer, as an observational astronomer, um, I um, look at the sky, look at the sky in uh, various ways, uh, and uh, um, it's it come a long way from um, astronomy when it was. Uh, the essentially the only science available to um, humans many thousands of years ago um, in terms of trying to figure out what the science do. Science helps us figure out nature, try to figure out what, what makes um, you know, things happen. And uh, the, the primary data available to everybody was the night sky and the sun in the day and the sky and, and, and what's happening out there. So in the absence of um, um, of television and uh, and daytime and nighttime entertainment. Um, this was the biggest entertainment for humans. We're looking at uh, changes in the sky. And so that's why there are a lot of stories about stars, a lot of stories about um, about the sky. Um, the sky helped people navigate even on land, going from one place to another. And I'm going to start with the basic notions of astronomy, which help people do this. So for example, people divided the, the sky into constellations to help remember things because the sky is very important. I mean, it's not as important now because we have other forms of entertainment. Uh, we can read books, but uh, um, the sky told um, stories. The sky told people um, where to go. And so people had to orient themselves um, in even directions, uh, even if you are you know, walking to the nearest uh, settlement, village, um, you followed um, certain patterns 
um, particularly in the night sky. And, and so, um, so they're divided into um, these. But one thing we must remember is that we still use this, this kind of notion of the sky. Uh, and we say this thing is an Orion, whatever, etc. But um, here's Orion, by the way, um, very familiar constellation. Um, but um, it, it's not true that these stars are associated with each other. So e in each of these patterns, you would have stars that are at different distances from us, right? But they look as near on the sky. So often there is this um, misplaced notion that uh, we talk about a, a certain object in the sky, a group of things, and they actually know about each other because they can be, you know, many of these stars are at very, very different distances. In the um, sky, you would um, see um, a, a very different picture. Um, let me see. Is my network working all right? Just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to switch to. A different network. Can somebody comment on whether I'm uh, my my network is freezing or not? You're audible and we can see you perfectly well, sir. Well done. So <clears throat> that's right. So the thing is, that's how we uh, we remember things. Even now, we remember things uh, in the sky uh, with respect to sort of these patterns. So uh, almost everybody here knows what. Ursa Major is the Big Dipper, um, uh, and most of us uh, look at um, the sky and see North uh, uh, and thinking of North as Polaris, which is the North Star, right? In the Southern Hemisphere, there is no, I mean, North Star is, identifies the North Pole in the sky for us, and that is essentially along the axis around which the Earth turns. Right? In the South, of course, there is nothing uh, like that in uh, marking South. Um, just basic um, astronomical measures. If you really want to know in terms of uh, angles, uh, astronomers measure things in angles and uh, um, the size of the full moon, for example, or the size of the sun is half a degree. And uh, uh, if you stretch your hand and and see the thickness of your finger, it's about a degree um, and the, the segments of um, the front finger are three, four and six degrees. That's a that, that's a way to uh, measure distances between things and also sizes of things. Now, if you look at how the stars move in the sky, you will see that uh, this is actually a real picture of um, um, as one of the earliest ever done. This is Dave Malin's picture from the 70s when he stunned the world by doing this, by keeping a camera open uh, for the whole night. Um, and this is at the site of the Anglo-Australian telescope um, in New South Wales. So this is in the southern hemisphere and you can see the camera was open for maybe eight hours because you can see the, the trails of, of the stars in the sky and, um, and how long they last. Each star goes around because the Earth is turning, of course. And in, in, in this during this exposure, a car has come up and gone. There's an astronomer up, up on the gangway on, on that telescope uh, smoking a cigarette and, and stuff like that. So you can see all, all the things happening during the night. But the most striking thing is, and maybe it's uh, it's open for about 12, um, 10 to 12 hours because it depends on, must, must be a winter night. You can see most stars, um, I mean all stars would, would, would be almost a semicircle. Um, it also shows you that colors of stars vary. There's some blue stars, red stars, yellow stars, etc. Right? I mean, now you have very spectacular pictures. You could take your own picture. Um, like this, uh, uh, but this was this was uh, uh, very revealing, showing that the Earth turns, of course. Now, one of the things is that um, I just orient yourself in the sky. You should uh, figure out then, uh, say for example, you are kidnapped and taken to an unknown location, and you know you wake up and you want to know where you are. How would you know that? In in you could be anywhere in the world. First of all, um, this kind of a diagram would tell you whether you're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, because in the northern hemisphere, right in the middle of this diagram, there will be a star, and that's the pole star, right? So everything revolves around the pole star. But um, the other thing is that the pole around which everything revolves 
the, the elevation of that from the ground in terms of angles, and I showed you how to measure angles with your fingers, um, is the elevation, uh, is, is the latitude of the place. Okay. So you can figure out which latitude here, for example, um, uh, this particular telescope is at uh, 30 degrees south. So, um, so this, this star is just about 30 degrees from the horizon. Um, you can work this out. Uh, for example, if you, um, uh, from, from a diagram like this, uh, if you are, say this is the Earth, and you are standing at this uh, position O prime. Um, the, uh, um, your head is pointing towards the zenith. Perpendicular to it is what's called the horizon. The horizon would be on the ground. And, um, and so uh, the angle that your position subtends with the center of the Earth um, with, and the, the, with the equator, which is that this the great circle that goes around the middle of, of the of the earth is lambda, which is the the latitude of the place, right? So at the poles, the latitude is uh, is ninety degrees. Uh, on the equator, it is zero. And um, I'm in at at eighteen degrees in Pune, for example. And so, um, <clears throat> if so from simple geometry, you can figure out that the angle between the horizon, uh, you can you can do it yourself um, from this diagram. And the poles, uh, the pole star is going to be the same as lambda, just from the various uh, triangles in here, right? And so the idea is then, um, so the, this this kind of diagram, um, it, it's then obvious if you are standing on the equator, um, the pole star would be on the horizon, and so all um, uh, such trails would be um, semicircles. Everything rises, everything sets. In this particular diagram, you can see many stars do not set. These are called circumpolar stars. And uh, there are many stars that you don't see, which are below the horizon. These, those are visible only from lower latitude. Uh, if you are standing on the North Pole or the South Pole, then every single star trail will be a circle, right? Nothing rises or sets. Everything is circumpolar, OK? So that's one thing to, to remember, right? So, um, uh, yeah, well, so this is this is the basic definition. Then you're right ahead, on top of your edge is zenith, perpendicular that is horizon, and uh, and and uh, you are imagining everything centered on you normally when you're an astronomer. Now, if you think of um, a different sort of coordinate system, where you're looking at um, not your zenith, but the Earth's. Uh, rotation, then uh, you're looking at um, the Earth's pole, celestial pole, and uh, the southern pole and the northern pole. This is how the Earth turns, right? And so what I just defined as the equator here is actually a plane that goes through the Earth, which is perpendicular to this polar axis, right? Yeah. And so that's that's the that's and if you take that and you imagine of an imagine imagine a sphere a transparent sphere around the Earth, and you take the equatorial plane, the equator of the Earth, and you stretch it that plane up to infinity, where it cuts the um, this sphere, which I would call the celestial sphere, would be the celestial equator, right? So uh, it's just like the Earth's own. Um, uh, system of coordinates. You have the equator and the latitude and the longitude. Um, on the sky, you can just take the equator e equatorial plane of the Earth and stretch it, and uh, the, you, you will find a circle in the sky that will be the celestial equator. Right. So if you're standing at the equator, that particular great circle would go above you, beyond your zenith. Right. And uh, and so. Um, uh, that that's how I define we define uh, a celestial set of coordinates rather than defining in terms of somebody uh, who's the observer because they can be anywhere on the Earth and so that coordinate system will change with the observer to make it independent of that we define it in terms of the Earth. So I just showed you these star trails. Um, then this just shows you that if, for example, you are standing at a, at a particular place on the Earth, and if you look at how the poles work, um, I told you that the angle between 
the horizon, which is this, this is the horizon for this particular person, um, would be um, the latitude of the place. And so these stars will always uh, be up, called circumpolar stars. These stars down here will never be seen by this person, right? And this is why um, a lot of us um, have to go to the Southern Hemisphere to observe, because for, uh, may, a lot of exciting objects are not seen from the Northern Hemisphere. The center of the Milky Way, for example, is in the Southern Hemisphere. Most of the people who do galactic astronomy have to go to Southern Hemisphere telescopes. I go to Chile a lot in South Africa. Things like that. So um, during the day, the sun, um, uh, just very briefly, it's, it's not relevant, but the sun essentially is, uh, um, is seen to rise and set. And you know that it does not rise and set at the same point every day. Um, it only rises at the east and sets at the west on two days of the of the year. That's the, the equinoxes. We just had, um, uh, um, uh, so sorry, the, um, it rises uh, east and, and uh, west on the solstices. Um, and uh, um, uh, we had uh, just had the, uh, the autumn equinox. And uh, um, so, um, and, and, and that uh, was the, the, the uh, uh, the, the day the sun rises exactly at east and sets in the west. Um, it, it then travels. It's now doing this. It's traveling towards um, the winter solstice, which will happen um, on December 21st, um, when you would see that the sun is uh, the lowest in the sky and also is up for the least amount of time. And you can see why. And, uh, and that is because uh, it is farthest from the east. Um, when it rises, and uh, so it, it, whether it's in the south or not depends on which hemisphere it, you're at. Um, and then um, uh, on, um, um, on on June twenty uh, first, which is the summer solstice, you can see it is up the longest in the um, uh, in the sky, and uh, and and this is this uh, this is why where it is uh, also the farthest from the east uh, when it rises. So this is uh, um, the sun's uh, trajectory in the sky, of course, uh, relative to us, um, is called ecliptic. And, uh, um, uh, and so uh, if you look at yourself as kind of the center, as it were, as people thought always uh, till a few hundred years ago, um, but it's, it's convenient to think in those terms of the sun rising and, and setting and the sun going around you rather than you going around the sun. Uh, then you can see that the sun's um, um, orbit in the sky and uh, the uh, celestial equator, as I defined, uh, they um, uh, are not the same. And the sun's uh, uh, orbit in the sky is, is called ecliptic, actually because everything is in the plane uh, in the solar system, all the planets also uh, follow the same um, uh, path in the sky on the ecliptic. Right, and these two are at an angle, and uh, uh, and they cross each other uh, at the uh, places where the equinoxes happen. This is why uh, they cross each other uh, on the um, on the vernal equinox, which is March 21st, and the autumn equinox, which is uh, September 21st. So, um, so these are the two places where this is why that's where um, the sun uh, rises exactly. Uh, in the east, <clears throat> right? So this is um, uh, this this kind of summarizes what I just said. Right. Now, um, just as we have um, latitude and longitude uh, in the sky um, uh, on the Earth, in the sky we have latitude and longitude as well, and, and these are called right ascension and declination. So if you want to do anything with astronomical data, you use uh, these terms. Uh, and right ascension is the same as the longitude and latitude is a declination. Now, uh, I just said that the way this is defined is that um, the Earth's equatorial plane hits the, the, the imaginary celestial sphere and that gives you the, um, the equator, right? And to so think about the Earth, think about how you measure uh, latitude on the Earth you look at the angle from that equatorial plane uh, and uh, going towards the pole. And, and so it's this angle, 
right? If you're in spherical polar coordinates, then um, it's 90 minus that angle. Spherical polar coordinates, the, the, that angle, the theta, is measured from the pole. In, in this system, it's measured from the equator, right? So, and that's called the declination. You can see that this angle is called the declination from the equator up to where this object is in the sky. So here you are standing on the Earth somewhere. Now, you, you, we're defining this now in terms of the Earth, not you. So as I said, we have the celestial equator and the pole, and then any position, the position of any star in the sky um, or planet or whatever would be given by the declination, which is the latitude, which would be measured from the equator, and the longitude, which uh, on the Earth, if you think uh, how it's done, we define uh, a meridian in um, uh, on the Earth. It's the Greenwich Meridian, which is London. And then we um, measure the angle phi along this celestial equator line as an angle, right? And so um, from London, we measure the angle and that call that the longitude. On the sky, um, the London, the, the place from where the longitude is measured is the place where the ecliptic and the equatorial plane cross. And that's the vernal equinox. So that's where the sun is on the 21st of March. That place is the meridian, right? So from there, you measure the, uh, the, the longitude. And that's called the right ascension. And uh, it's measured in hours. So um, unlike um, on the Earth, where you can have a longitude going from 0 to 360 degrees, here it goes from 0 to 24 hours. So 15 degrees is an hour, right? So if a star is at three hours right ascension, it means it's 45 degrees uh, in uh, from the vernal equinox. On. So that, that's a very unique system. Now, this doesn't depend on the position of the person on the Earth, right? Uh, it just means that you are... Um, uh, it, uh, it it it's it's with it's it's with respect to the Earth, not with respect to the observer, and it's very clearly defined in terms of the equator of the Earth and the celestial pole. So this is how you define these um, these these coordinates. It's called the equatorial coordinates. Okay, there are other coordinate systems. For example, you can do the same thing. For example, from um, the galac galactic coordinates, which means that you take the plane of the galaxy as the equatorial plane. You take the um, axis along with the galaxy is spinning and you know that kind of stuff, but it depends on what you want to do. Normally we use uh, the, um, the celestial coordinates. I'm going to um, then quickly say one of the ways we measure distances in astronomy. It is very, very important uh, because uh, of course distances uh, give you the three dimensional view. Without distances, you wouldn't know how bright something is or how big something is. The sun and the moon are the same size in the sky, but you know one is a thousand times bigger than the other, roughly, and, and it just means that uh, they are at different distances from you. Um, the basic way of um, uh, measuring uh, distance to a star, I said we measure things in angles, and uh, is to is to look at uh, what is known as parallax. Now, parallax is something that uh, uh, we experience all the time. Our we have two eyes. And the way our brain makes up a three dimensional view of everything around us is to look at the slight differences between the two pictures, the two eyes see and make out um, the, the relative distances. So you can do this exercise yourself. If you hold your um, uh, thumb out at a certain distance from you and you see it, you close one eye after the other and see it from a different perspective, you will see that it moves a little, right? The, the thumb moves. Bring it very close to you and do the same thing. Close one eye and the other, and you'll see it moves a lot more. And 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 this is exactly uh, how uh, we can measure distance. We can know how far away my thumb is. So uh, as the Earth moves around the sun, say uh, from January to July, the position of a star in the sky also moves a very tiny amount. And uh, uh, the ones that are very far away, um, you know, would move uh, a lot less. The ones that are nearby would move a lot more. And so we can figure out just by monitoring how much a star moves during the during the year, because the Earth goes around the sun, well, we can figure out how far away they are. And so at, in astronomy, we measure 
um, these distances in terms of this parallax. And uh, in, in astronomy, uh, our me basic measuring unit is called a parsec. And a parsec is just um, a star that is, has a parallax of one arc second, right? A second of arc where 3,600 seconds of arc make a degree. 60 arc seconds make an arc minute, right? So, uh, so the basic uh, uh, unit of angular measure is one arc second, and a parsec then is uh, the distance. Now, if you think of in terms of light years, as I've mentioned here, which is a more uh, organic way of measuring things, uh, you know that how much, uh, what speed of light is and how much distance light goes in a year, then a parsec is about three and a quarter light years, it turns out. It's interesting that uh, one arc second being our kind of smallest unit that we use, the nearest star is about a parsec away from us, slightly more than one. So it just means that all parallaxes we measure are less than a parc uh, an arc second. Uh, and, and so that, that kind of tells you that stars actually move because of the motion of the Earth around the sun, stars move in the sky uh, very little. The other unit that you will often come across is the astronomical unit, and that is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. That sets the scale in the solar system. It actually um, is convenient if you are doing planetary science in uh, within the solar system. If you're working on the galaxy or if you're working on the universe, then that is too small a unit, and, uh, and that's why we use parsecs. So galaxy distances are measured in megaparsecs because the typical distance between two galaxies is a million parsecs. Within our own galaxy, stars are um, are um, uh, are parsecs apart. I mean, the uh, nearest star, as I said, to us is about a parsec away. So, um, so this is kind of the, the typical distances between stars is about a parsec. Typical sizes of galaxies are kiloparsecs. Our galaxy is about 20, 30, 40, something like that, kiloparsecs across. And the distance between galaxies is megaparsec, right? Okay, so I, I, I saw that. The other thing um, I, you know, we, we told you that you um, should know about is uh, about black body curves. I'm sure all of you have come across um, black bodies um, in, um, in, in physics. Um, uh, and we know that uh, if you have a black body, then um, um, the shape of the spectrum, the continuum that is emitted by a black body is, is the Planck law. And the Planck law is such that um, for different temperatures, the, um, the peak shifts to um, lower wavelength, um, higher uh, frequencies, uh, and, and, and so um, hotter uh, objects are, um, are bluer um, in, in terms of our um, um, our range of visibility. Now, it so turns out that for stars, uh, our sun has a surface temperature of 6000 K, and you can see that it peaks at about the green part of the spectrum, um, uh, which is why we see the sun to be yellow green. And uh, uh, but then newborn stars, stars that are, uh, you know, really uh, fresh um, and reborn are uh, more than 10,000 degrees, maybe 20,000 degrees hot. And so their peak would be in the ultraviolet. And, uh, and uh, bigger stars or older stars, um, uh, which are cooler, um, would uh, have a peak in the infrared, which is beyond uh, our, um, you know, our visible range. Our visible range is very tiny in this, uh, in, in this, in this kind of plot. Right? So it's in interesting to know that most of the radiation that comes out from a, a dwarf star or a newly born um, massive star um, uh, would be outside our um, our visible range. Star's color depends on its temperature, and because a star is is a, is, is a body, is a black body. And uh, in this context, you've come across the Stefan Boltzmann law as well. In addition to Wien's law, Wien's law tells you the peak where the peak would happen. That tells you the color of the star. You saw those star trails, and you saw that stars are different colors. And, and that's because um, the cooler stars, which is often the giant stars, the stars that are very big, have lower surface temperature. And um, we'll see why in a minute. Um, and then, uh, um, and then, so they are redder um, stars that are um, uh, younger, or stars that are um, hotter, uh, would be bluer. And um, 
But then also uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law, which I'm sure everybody's come across, also gives you the area under the black body curve. And uh, the area under the black body curve then is, um, uh, it tells you the total energy that's uh, being um, emitted by the star per unit time. So that's the power in watts. And uh, that is given by the area of the star uh, times um, t to the power four. So it's a very strong uh, dependence on temperature. And this is why you can see that um, the black body curves corresponding to temperatures that are 3000, 6000, 12000, so dramatically vary. And it also means that these uh, hotter stars are not just bluer, but they are much brighter as well. Right? And, and, and so um, putting together, uh, we, can, we can see then um, uh, that uh, you, can, you can find out, for example, for the sun, you know that uh, the sun's temperature is 6000 Kelvin. You know that the radius is uh, whatever it is, seven times 28 meters. You can figure out what the luminosity of the sun is because Stefan Boltzmann constant, that 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 little constant there, is is very well known, right? And it turns out that the sun's temperature is uh, the sun's power, um, uh, given that its temperature is roughly 6,000 K, uh, is um, is is 10 to the four times 10 to the 26 watts. So that um, that kind of sets a standard, and um, in in. Uh, astronomy, we use uh, the unit, um, which is the, the solar luminosity, right? So that's L sun. Um, if you convert that into some kind of uh, uh, um, energy that you that 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 comes to you, so you're looking at the sun, you're not seeing the entire energy that the sun emits at all wavelengths. So what you do is you you find uh, that uh, in what um, how much of that comes to you. You need to understand what solid angle is. I'm sure everybody here knows a solid angle is a three dimensional angle and it's given by, um, um, you know, um, this kind of a concept in which if you have an area, which is ds, uh, which subtends an angle theta at a point, then uh, d omega gives you the, the solid angle um, and uh, the unit of solid angle is the steradian, um, which is a radian squared. Um, so um, that kind of defines things everybody's come across before, but in the context of the amount of light that falls on a particular detector or on a particular telescope, um, that um, you know, for for our measuring um, from a star or uh, uh, an object in the sky it could be a galaxy, um, it, you you have to define these quantities called flux and intensity. Um, just look at the unit. This is boring stuff, but it's very, very important. Um, the unit of watts per meter square, right? So you have um, a per unit area, the amount of power that falls on a particular detector or a telescope. Um, and so amount of energy that passes through this uh, particular uh, object per unit time. Uh, and But you also have to um, specify a certain range in frequency because you always measure when you're measuring energy in at a particular frequency. So, um, uh, so the, the unit is watts per meter squared per hertz, and that's the unit of flux. Um, radio astronomers use uh, uh, um, a unit called Jansky, and you can see it's 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter squared per hertz. Astronomical objects are very, very faint. Um, you can also um, define something called intensity, which is directional, which has per unit solid angle in it. But I'm not going to work on that. Let's look at flux. So the entire um, power emitted by an object then is an integral of this intensity um, over everything, overall solid angle, overall frequencies, overall. I mean, so you can see because you had uh, watts per unit area per unit. Um, um, frequency per unit, uh, solid angle, integrate everything. That's called the luminosity. Luminosity is the entire energy that's emitted for, for the sun. For example, it's, uh, um, I, I showed you, we, we, we calculated it in one. So um, in optical astronomers, I mean, radio astronomers use something called Jansky, which I showed you. Optical astronomers often use what is known as magnitudes. And uh, these magnitudes um, uh, are um, um, very arcane, uh, only used by optical astronomers 
and they are on the logarithmic scale. Now, this essentially um, uh, came from naked eye astronomers, um, and uh, um, uh, the basic system was devised uh, um, a couple of uh, millennia ago. And the idea is that if you look at the um, stars that are seen with the naked eye, then uh, the um, and, and you recognize the fact that the eye is a logarithmic uh, detector. Um, it's very similar to sound when you measure things in decibels because we know that our ears are also logarithmic detectors. And so um, uh, we think uh, always, always measure things on a logarithmic scale. Uh, the way it was dev devised was that um, the magnitude scale, uh, the brightest, uh, the, the faintest stars that the naked eye can see from a dark site would be about sixth magnitude, and the brightest ones would be um, first magnitude, right? So uh, just shows that um, uh, um, on, on this scale, on a logarithmic scale, it goes from one to six. Now, this scale was calibrated for the first time and the word um, and, and related to uh, flux and intensity by uh, a man called uh, Pogson, um, who was the, in charge of the um, Madras Observatory. He was the first director uh, of the Madras Observatory under British rule in the in the 1790s, uh, and, and uh, that's another distinction that uh, Indian astronomers can have. The magnitude scale was actually devised in India. Uh, if you look at uh, say the Pleiades, um, 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 which uh, has these stars, it's very familiar. A lot of uh, astronomers uh, use Pleiades as, as something that they see with small telescope. Um, the stars that are in the Pleiades are this kind of magnitude, and you can see that um, um, only a few of them are, are visible to the naked eye um, and of the brightest stars. Um, the visible magnitude scale um, then, according to Pogson, uh, is defined as this. So it's a very funny system of units. The difference in magnitude between two objects is uh, negative minus 2.5 the ratio of the intensities or of the fluxes of um, give it that just point objects like stars of the of the two objects so um, this is very similar to the um, decibel scale for sound except that the two differences one is there's a 2.5 in the middle in in the front so it's not just the log of the ratio of the intensities it is the um, 2.5 times that and this is to fit into that one to six uh, system that was devised by the ancient Greeks, uh, maybe even older than that. Maybe the Babylonians started it. We don't know really. But um, um, but the other thing is, it's all it also has a minus in front, which means that the brighter stars have smaller magnitudes. The brightest star is is one and the things etc. But of course, with telescopes. This stretches um, bit, uh, much beyond one and six, and uh, and so the faintest stars that we now detect with the largest telescopes in the world are 27, 28 magnitude, uh, and the brightest star is, uh, as we know, is Sirius, which is actually minus 1.5. It's not really the the brightest star is not one. It's uh, the brighter stars really. The brightest star, according to this system, is uh, minus 1.5. Um, the sun in this system would have a magnitude of minus 26.7, but the sun wasn't considered a star when this uh, system was devised. Um, so here you are, the magnitude system. Um, sorry, <coughs> um, which is the difference of magnitudes is this minus 2.5 log. Of the um, of the ratio of intensities, you turn that around. It means the ratio of intensities can be calculated from magnitude. So if a star is 100 times brighter than another star, then the difference in magnitude would be five, right? According to this calculation, and the brighter star would have a smaller number in magnitude. Okay, remember that. So so we now know um, how to uh, describe position. In astronomy and also uh, magnitudes. Uh, these are things that you uh, deal with uh, regular on a regular basis, right? Now, um, of course, we just uh, talked about apparent magnitude, means the 
magnitude according to the amount of light that falls on your detector. Now, in reality, uh, you also want to know how bright something is, and so you have to define it in terms of the distance, right? So you know that light falls off as one over R squared, one over D squared, and so actually the brightness of an object or the flux, the intensity, whatever um, quantity you use, is at the actual luminosity of an object divided by four pi D squared, right? And so the absolute luminosity or the absolute magnitude uh, would then come from multiplying the intensity of an object by d squared. Then, so um, you can define then uh, from the definition of uh, apparent magnitude, you can define something called the absolute magnitude, which uh, for convenience is defined as apparent magnitude of something that's put at a distance of 10 parsec from you. And that is given by this formula. So the absolute magnitude is the um, uh, capital M, which is the uh, the act, which is the magnitude version of the luminosity of the, act, the amount of power that's coming out of the object, and the difference between them, uh, just from these formulae that we just saw, you because L goes uh, L the luminosity goes as um, um, is proportional to d squared. Um, is is given by this, right? Five log d at ten percent. Something to remember. So something a magnitude of a star, if it's placed at d parsecs, gives you the difference between the ap apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude of an object. And you can calculate, for example, uh, what the distance modulus um, to the sun is. So it's some kind of a logarithmic distance. And, and then distances are calculated according to them. So this sets the magnitude scale. So the apparent magnitude of the sun, as I said, is minus 26. My full moon is minus 12. Those are not what the magnitude scale was devised for. But if you look at um, the brightest stars there, you know, uh, Vega, Spica, these are around from 0 to 1 and things like that. Okay. So. Um, here uh, you have, um, um, and then I will end this segment by talking about um, color um, because we need that um, to discuss stars. Uh, so um, how do you define color? Um, what is color, color of a star? I just told you there are blue stars and red stars, and, um, and uh, these are defined in terms of the temperature of the star. And that's a surface temperature given by the black body curve. But observationally, if you want to define a color, you would again look at the um, the intensity or the magnitude of a star um, that you can um, um, measure using a certain filter. And so there are the standard filters called UVVRI filters. Um, uh, v is visual, which is the middle of the optical spectrum. Uh, that the yellow green that is, and these are um, red and near infrared and blue and ultra blue or violet, really ultraviolet is outside of visual. And these are the response curves in terms of um, the wavelength in angstroms. Angstroms are 10 times um, nanometers, as you see. So, um, so th this is the visual range really from about 3,500 angstroms to about 800, 8,500 and this the the, um, the UVVRI filters um, essentially define they're not Gaussians or or Planck curves or whatever they have a certain um, it depends on the property of the material used but they're standardized and these are um, these are um, uh, set at uh, the centers of these filters are at this kind of nanometers just uh, multiply by ten for angstroms and um, and so um, these are standard definition filters. And once you define the VRI filters, then uh, what what it does is that it then defines the color of a star by this formula. So if you have uh, if you measure the fluxes in two different filters of the same star, um, the difference in magnitude, which would mean the ratio of the fluxes or intensities. Um, the difference in magnitude would find a color. 
that's exactly what color is. When you see something as red, it just means that just the flux that you're receiving from it in the red is more than the flux that you're receiving in the blue. And so the ratio is going to be different from something that is green or, or blue. So this formalizes it. A color is just the ratio of fluxes, but in the magnitude system, it's minus 2.5 log of that. OK, and there's a zero point for the filter, which uh, in, in this particular color index system in the UVVRI system is standardized. It's calibrated such that that is zero for the star Vega. And uh, you, when you are setting up a photometric system um, with filters and, and uh, a camera, then you set it such that this constant is set to be zero and, and thus for Vega, for example, um, the color index, the color is just the difference between the two magnitudes of um, the, the two filters, whatever filter there is. Okay. So this is how we define color in, in astronomy. Okay. So now the flux density is uh, L over 4 pi d squared. The apparent magnitude I just told you is minus 2.5 log of this, and the color is then the difference um, um, the, the ratio of the tweet density. So I'll briefly talk about uh, because you know um, uh, how much time do I have? Organizers. About like half an hour more. OK, <clears throat> so I yeah. yeah, so of course we'll have questions at the end. Thanks. So I'm um, I have two um, uh, two um, things to cover in this time. One I'm going to talk about the reason I um, um, described um, uh, magnitudes and luminosities and color is I'm going to talk about uh, how stars are put on a sequence uh, called the husband Russell diagram. And then uh, towards the end, I'm going to talk about galaxies and dark matter. And so um, um, and, and so let's let's launch into that. So let's look at how stars are imagined in astronomy. Star is essentially a, a ball of plasma. That is a black body, right? Now, um, what's happening in a star is that this plasma, uh, and it has to be to be, become a star. It has to have nuclear fusion in the middle. So, um, uh, what's happening is that it's it's a, a ball of gas that uh, plasma we could just call gas, and and it, it's trying to contract due to gravitation, uh, but. Uh, but but it, that's being prevented by the thermal motion of the individual particles in the star, um, which is um, which has thermal motion because temperature. And why is, is it a certain temperature? Uh, it is because that it has a, a source of energy in the middle, and right in the middle there's thermal nuclear energy coming out because of a thermal nuclear uh, fusion reaction that's going on in the star. And, and this keeps on um, the, the, the maintains the temperature of the star and the star radiates the energy as it comes to the surface. That's how um, and the whole thing is in what is called hydrostatic equilibrium. So the pressure due to the heated gas um, and the um, and the pull of gravity inwards, the balance of the two sets the size of the star, the radius. OK, so that's that's in short what is known as the hydrostatic equilibrium. So um, the sun, um, the sun or the stars, they, they emit um, energy. Um, so um, um, no star has an infinite reserve of energy. So eventually when um, the fuel that is being used by the star to fuse uh, into um, um, for the further fusion reaction in the middle uh, uh, finishes, then the star is finished, the star dies. But uh, the lifetime of a star then is essentially the time it uh, has the fuel to do um, the fusion in the middle. So imagine the star as a spherical ball of ideal gas. <clears throat> um, actually, um, it, it is an ideal gas because it's interesting that if you look at the sun's density, it's the same uh, density as water. But, um, uh, but uh, but the difference between water and the material in the sun is that the sun is ionized or the material is ionized because it's a plasma. And so it's not in molecular form as in water. So all the particles are separate, right? So all the electrons and protons and neutrons are, are, are essentially um, 
and it's, it's ionized. And so the nuclei and the, and the electrons are, 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 um, are separated from each other. And so the particles, um, uh, the distance between particles is much larger compared to the size. And so you can, com uh, you can think of it as a gas. That's why we call it, you know, uh, the material of the star as a gas, not a liquid, even though the density is the same as water. So something is in the hydrostatic equilibrium, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through, because I don't have time, go through this argument, but you can look it up in, in most places. Um, you can um, um, calculate just the, to balance the thermal energy and the gravitational energy, taking a small element, a cylindrical element in, this, in a star, uh, and you come up with the equation that looks like this, right? It just shows that there is a pressure gradient uh, in in a, in, a, in a star that uh, that would be negative. So the pressure would be very high towards the, the center, and uh, and this is what you know causes the uh, thermonuclear reaction to start in the center, and uh, and it, this the pressure gradient is given by the gravitation, of course, because it's the gravitation that's balance, balancing the thermal energy um, of um, the, the mass of the of the object and, and the radius. Okay. It's the pressure gradient that's supposed to start against collapse. Right. So um, if you then, because uh, you have uh, the pressure gradient is a function of the mass, you can plot the mass and luminosity of a star, and they would fall on a, on a this is logarithmic, they would be related to each other. There's a power law relation between the two, mass and luminosity. And, um, and you know, it's essentially, you can take the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, combine it with the Stefan Boltzmann law, and it gives you uh, a relation like this. And, and it's quite interesting because it tells you, um, and, it, you know, I, we also saw that in, when we looked at the black body curve and Stefan Boltzmann law, that the hotter things are much, much brighter. Uh, massive things are hotter because of uh, the, um, the thermal energy of its particles uh, due to hydrostatic equilibrium. And so the luminosity is connected with the mass of the star. So the brighter the star is, the more massive um, it is in this uh, particular relation. As you can see, the sun is in the middle. And if you have something that's 100 times um, the luminosity of the sun on the mass scale, it's about, you know, uh, about five times more things. So um, this leads to um, something that we call the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, um, which is if you have these stars that are um, um, generating energy in the middle throughout its lifetime, they are called stars that are in the main sequence, right? And uh, this kind of argument that I gave you defines the fact that um, uh, that you can um, do a plot in which you have luminosity, which is the total amount of uh, power radiated by any object in the y-axis. The x-axis is the temperature. Here uh, you see it's called the spectral type, which is essentially the color of the star. And, and so it is the temperature. Um, so this is a color and uh, luminosity diagram. And actually this is on a logarithmic scale, so it's a color and magnitude diagram. So this, this is why I, I kind of um, uh, introduced all these uh, quantities to you. You can see on the right hand side the absolute magnitude of the star. So that's your magnitude. And on the x axis, it's the temperature, okay, which is also its color because of the black body relation. The color of the star is given by its temperature. So it's a color magnitude diagram. And it tells you the different kinds of stars. So the main sequence are the are the stars that are in uh, a dynamic equilibrium generating energy in the middle where its gravitational energy is balanced by its thermal energy. Yeah, and so this defines this so-called main sequence of this star. In this particular diagram, you can see that, you know, th these are, and, and, and in a funny way, the temperature on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram um, increases uh, with decreasing x-axis. Um, and the luminosity goes up. So the hot, bright stars in this corner, the cool, dim stars in this corner, sun is right in the middle, right? And here you can see that, that the same thing here. It's the same diagram. <coughs> it just shows where different um, familiar stars are. 
sorry. So here the main sequence is like this. And as the sun's uh, or a star's um, um, position uh, in the main sequence ends, that means when it uh, finishes its uh, fuel, it moves out of the main sequence. And then it goes to a whole different uh, sequence of uh, evolution that I'm not going to go into today, because that, uh, that takes a few lectures. And uh, it, you know the, the star becomes uh, a red giant um, and goes into this part of the, because it, it, it blows up, blows, not blows up, but increases in size. And so it gets bloated. And so as it increases in size, its temperature also drops. Uh, so it becomes cool, but because it's large, uh, remember Stefan Boltzmann law has a four pi r squared in the front. If it's very large, its um, its uh, brightness goes up, but its temperature goes down, so it becomes cool and bright. It goes to this part of the HR diagram, and then uh, eventually it can end up as a white dwarf, as the sun will, right at the um, at this part of the HR diagram, where it won't have much energy to radiate because it's not producing any light, so it will be low luminosity, but it, it will be very hot because it will be very compact. Right, so here you are. The white dwarfs are here. The red giants are out there, and these are the main sequence stars. So remember, if you measure the color of a star by measuring its temperature or by measuring its flux in two different filters and taking the difference, that gives you its color and its magnitude is measured by, uh, you know, you take uh, um, uh, it, its uh, image in various filters and you kind of fit a, some kind of a black body to it and you can find um, um, its total luminosity and that gives you the y-axis of the HR diagram. It's very, very um, uh, uh, convenient um, way to, to find out what stars are doing. And of course, if you take the HR diagram for a cluster of stars, it shows all the different kinds of stars that are in that cluster, and uh, and and so it will tell you, um, um, uh, you know, the population of a cluster of stars or any part of the star. So here your main sequence and the giants, etc. It, it it the different parts of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram tells you uh, where a certain star would be, and the sun is right in the middle because this is all it just shows you the sun is a very ordinary star, and um, there are stars that are smaller or cooler than the sun and brighter as well. And the um, small cor corollary to this is that you can turn this argument around and look at the size of a star as well, because uh, from the, again, the Stefan Boltzmann law, L is four pi r squared, sigma t to the power four, right? And so r squared is then um, the ratio of the luminosity to the fourth power of its temperature. So the same HR diagram you can think of um, uh, is something that also tells you something about the size of the star. So remember the, the cooler but bigger stars are in this corner, the red giants, the blue super giants are on the main sequence, but these are the ones that are um, the newly formed stars that are still on the main sequence but are the massive stars, things like that. And so the size um, comes in uh, as a ratio of the of the luminosity, which is the y axis of the HR diagram and the x axis. This is log log, by the way. So um, uh, the luminosity, the log of the luminosity and the log of the temperature on the um, on the x axis. So um, depending on the, the, these two quantities, you can find the radius of the star. And you can see the sizes of the stars in different parts of the HR diagram. It's very convenient to to find out how big stars are. OK, so um, um, just I'll, I'll, uh, um, uh, a star's evolution then follows certain trajectories in the HR diagram, and I'm not going to talk about that. You might have um, another lecture on this later on in the day. I'm going to pass on in the in, in a few minutes, uh, spend a few minutes on um, galaxies and dark matter, which is the other thing I've been asked to cover very quickly. Um, actually, uh, the universe is not made up of stars, but of galaxies. Um, uh, it's like um, the basic building blocks of uh, matter are molecules, not atoms. Um, and uh, so the basic unit is a galaxy. 
Um, and of course, galaxies are made of stars, but made of other things as well, dust and gas and dark matter, stuff like that. So, um, but the galaxies are the basic building blocks and we live in a galaxy. In galaxies, there are of two kinds, elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies. About 75% of all galaxies are spiral and we live in one of these spiral galaxies. This is what our galaxy looks like. Um, our galaxies, spiral galaxies are flat, they're rotating galaxies and they have a bulge in the middle. And uh, in our galaxy, for example, we have the sun that is uh, not, of course, in the middle. It's about uh, eight kiloparsecs from the center of our galaxy. That's 25,000 light years. And, um, and you can see that the whole size of the galaxy is roughly about 40 to 50 kiloparsecs. You look from on the top. Uh, this is, of course, artist impression. You can't take a picture of our galaxy from within the galaxy. Uh, you can see that a, a galaxy has about um, five spiral arms. The sun would be here. And the sun would be going around in a circular orbit around the center of the galaxy. Um, and in, we know that the sun and the Earth, they are about four and a half billion years old uh, and it's gone around the galaxy about 20 times in its lifetime. So um, this is what the Milky Way would look from inside. I told you that um, uh, in, from the southern hemisphere, you can actually see the um, center of our galaxy better the Earth blocks, uh, you know, when you see stars, you see stars that belong to the Milky Way by looking at all directions. But if you're looking towards the middle of our galaxy, um, you really don't see um, uh, your, your vision is blocked by by the Earth. You have to go to the southern hemisphere. This is, for example, one of the telescopes in Chile that I go to uh, quite a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see the Milky Way and the center of the Milky Way, which is here a uh, very spectacular fashion. Now, um, <clears throat> A spiral galaxy, um, uh, if you try to figure out what the mass of a galaxy is, and this uh, is the segue into dark matter, um, you have to figure out uh, how to measure the mass of a galaxy like this, right? How would you do that? If you, if you worked in uh, the solar system and you tried to measure the mass of the sun, it's very easy because uh, most of the mass in the solar system is in the sun, and so you can take the planets as... Um, um, as um, uh, point objects and from the orbit of uh, which is roughly circular, you can measure uh, balance centrifugal force with gravitational force and find um, the mass of the central object very easily. Um, now you can try to do that in a galaxy. Remember the galaxy is such that uh, not all the mass is in the center, mass is distributed. And so you have to figure out how the velocities would go. In, in the solar system, what happens is that um, the, uh, because the mass is the most, uh, the sun is the most massive object, the, um, uh, the velocities of the planets fall off. And they fall off uh, uh, according to Kepler's laws. Um, and just by, and if you take it in circles, you can do exactly what I just said. You, um, you balance uh, mv squared over r, which is this, uh, and, and gmm over r squared, and, and you would find that velocity falls off with r uh, as one over the square root of r, right? So v squared falls off as r. And, and, and so the outer planets are going slow compared to the inner planets. But if you look at the solid body like this, for example, I, you know, when I was young, we used to use uh, compact disks or um, records, and they used to be solid objects, and you see them spin. Now you don't see too many things spinning anymore, but uh, but you you know the feeling. I mean, uh, if it's a platform that's spinning as a whole, then the angular speed is constant, and v is proportional to r. So v uh, is uh, uh, goes up if you go um, uh, away from the center of this object then at a distance r, the linear velocity is, uh, is proportional to the radius because the angular speed is constant. That's very different from here, where v is falling off as r, and it's falling off as one over the square root, yeah? So these are then two different ways of looking at rotation, and the question is what's happening in the galaxy? The galaxy is the galaxy, um, so if you, for example, are going out here, then most, much of the mass of the galaxy is within you. And so you expect 
the uh, velocities of stars to fall off, like in the solar system. And um, so this was the biggest uh, uh, surprise um, in the 1970s when this was done. Uh, the person who did it first is Vera Rubin, who passed away a couple of years ago, and now one of the greatest um, telescopes is being built <coughs> is named after her. Vera Rubin in 1970 um, <coughs> did this with radio astronomy. What she did was, as you know, in galaxies, you have cold gas and uh, which stretches far um, beyond the stars in a galaxy. And this you can pick up with a radio telescope and neutral hydrogen. This is atomic hydrogen. And uh, so if you take a galaxy that is uh, um, that is edge on uh, and you look at um, the um, Doppler shift, the velocities of individual atomic hydrogen particles um, with the radio telescope, because we know the rest frequency of atomic hydrogen um, it is, uh, is 1400 megahertz. Um, it's, uh, it's very, um, uh, this particular transition, which is the spin flip transition of atomic hydrogen, uh, 21 centimeters in wavelength. Um, then you look at the Doppler shift and you can find out the, 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 the velocities. So what she did was she did it for five galaxies for her master's thesis and found that instead of what you expect, which is outside the galaxy, the velocity is falling off as one over r to the power half. It kept on rising and and leveled off. And so these are called flat rotation curves. Of course, her paper was rejected. She was a woman working in the 70s, also a, a junior master student when a much, much more senior um, professor, male professor repeated her work and found the same result um, thing in the in the 1970s. Um, this became more of a fashion and, and the idea is this. So um, it, it just shows you that um, if you take a galaxy and you go outside the galaxy and you have test particles, it, it just shows that um, there is quite a lot of matter outside uh, these galaxies uh, and uh, otherwise they will uh, the rotation curves would fall off and yet in almost all galaxies that we know and I myself measured rotation curves in various ways now you can do this with optical um, spectra as well um, of hundreds of galaxies um, we, we haven't found a single galaxy in which the rotation curve actually falls um, and so um, this means that uh, the, if, if you have a flat rotation curve, uh, that then there is a lot of matter outside um, the, the stars in a galaxy, and this is what we call the star matter. So if you take Kepler's laws and uh, you, you find, um, um, uh, sorry, yes. So the idea is that in the middle, so the galaxy's rotation curves looks like this. In the middle, it goes up like a solid body. This is where the bulge of the galaxy is. I showed you how the solid body is V is proportional to R. And then you expect it to fall off like that, but it doesn't. It, it, it keeps steady. And this means that if you have the, um, if you have just the components that you see, it uh, accounts for something like this. And the difference between the two, the difference between the, the, the amount of matter that you expect in the disk and the amount of matter that there is in a dark halo, as it were, is uh, is 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 uh, uh, it, they all add up to this rotation curve. It's flat, and it just means that there's a dark halo surrounding all galaxies, going stretching out to many times the size of the galaxy, and uh, it just tells you that uh, there's the dark matter. And the dark matter uh, halos would look like this. In simulations, you can see this now, but um, this is what a galaxy would then look like. So you have the galaxy in the middle, which is a small disk, but it will be surrounded by a very large um, amount of matter. In fact, uh, it probably 10 times the amount of matter that you see in stars are in uh, dark matter halos of these galaxies. Now, um, so in our galaxy, it would be something like that. Um, and, and this has been measured also in our galaxy, uh, but it's much more difficult to do it within our own galaxy. You, you see dark matter, and I'm going to wrap up um, now. Um, by talking about gravitational lensing very briefly, um, dark matter. Uh, this is, you know, in a way, a dynamical way of measuring the presence of dark matter. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this was questioned in the 70s and 80s by saying, um, so what if you're applying Newton's laws? What if Newton's laws don't really hold on the scale of a galaxy? 
uh, what if you change uh, gravity on, on galactic scales slightly, um, uh, then uh, uh, you can account for this kind of uh, rotation curves that you see. Um, uh, you can come across something called modified Newtonian dynamics, MOND, that became very fashionable. But then we started detecting dark matter in other ways, many, many different other ways. Uh, and one of them was gravitational lensing. So what happens is that uh, as you know, light is bent. Um, uh, the trajectory of light is bent by matter, and this is because in Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity, it just tells you that the way to look at gravity is that um, uh, is that matter bends space-time, and light then follows uh, the shortest distance along space-time, so it bends. So, uh, in Newtonian dynamics, this won't happen, but in in the current uh, theory of gravity that we believe in, this this happens and, and was seen everywhere. So here you are in the Milky Way, you're looking at a distant galaxy, and you can see the galaxy's um, image by um, uh, light that's coming from it to you, but actually on the way it encounters uh, various halos of dark matter. It could be around galaxies or it could be a, a cluster of galaxies in which is has a lot of dark matter. Uh, in, in the common space in between the galaxies, um, uh, you wouldn't see that dark matter, but what you would see is that um, the light that's coming through uh, this, this uh, blob of matter would be bent, but your eye would see it uh, in different places. And so um, you would see essentially uh, mirages in the sky. So what would happen is that if you have a distant galaxy, you would see uh, instead of that galaxy, you see in two different places. If it's if if you see it along two different lines of sight, actually, if you um, if they're per perfectly aligned, the lens and the galaxy, you would see it as a circle, right? And it's it's called the Einstein ring. Um, and uh, so this was predicted uh, soon after Einstein um, published his theory of relativity um, uh, in the, in 1915, for example. But gravitational lensing of galaxies uh, would start, which started to be fashionable in theory in the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s. People started predicting that you would see multiple images of things and, and also distorted images, uh, ring-like images, etc. They were not discovered till the 1970s, 80s, and, and now we see a lot of these. So the Einstein ring uh, images, you can actually see them. These are, this is of course a real image. Uh, you can see that you, here's a galaxy in the foreground and you're looking at a galaxy in the background and you can see there's a ring around it. And, and this galaxy is actually something that's the same as this galaxy, but just just very far away. Now, how do you know that it's like this? Because you can measure the spectrum and look at the the uh, the spectrum tells you the redshift of the galaxy. You can see that this this galaxy in there is much, much more distant than than the foreground galaxy. And so these are some examples of uh, um, ground-based and space-based ob observations of Einstein rings, um, which are, are beautiful, it just shows. Uh, and so here it's wonderful. And so you just, uh, if you misalign it slightly, then the Einstein ring breaks up. Here's one image of uh, one galaxy, and you can see it in, in all these different forms, very, very distorted. And, and this, this is kind of then the ultimate um, uh, picture of um, gravitational lenses. Here's a, a foreground cluster of galaxies that um, essentially um, uh, is revealing how much matter it has by showing all these distant galaxies, these galaxies in, in very distorted form in their partial Einstein rings. In this particular image uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope, there are about 100 such uh, lensed galaxies which are in the uh, background. In the foreground is Abel 2218, which is at a redshift of 0.2. The galaxies that you see highly distorted are at redshifts of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, uh, very far away, and you see them in various various distorted forms. You can see them in multiple images. For example, here, this galaxy and that galaxy, and that uh, ga galaxy images here, they are, they are exactly the same galaxy. You see them in five different places, and uh, all, often in, um, in, in very distorted forms. Here, you can see that a galaxy has been imaged um, that is in a, as an Einstein ring uh, around this particular cluster. Now, what this does is that this helps us model the amount of matter in the cluster of galaxies. 
and this shows uh, and, and so pictures like this uh, and it's very simple to do because it's a simple geometrical thing. It's Fermat's principle and uh, I've had PhD students work on these things where you can model the amount of matter in the foreground object. You didn't know the distance from its redshift and for each of these background objects that are seen in these distorted images, you can measure their redshift and you, you know how far away they are. And so then you do ray tracing and figure out how much matter is needed to cause the bend in light that would cause this distorted image. And that reveals that in clusters of galaxies, the amount of matter um, uh, that there is, is uh, hundreds of times, sometimes it's three, four hundred times the amount of light, amount of matter that's in the stars. And, and so that, that tells us that most of the matter in the universe is dark. And I'm stop there. Uh, by by essentially saying that this is the very compelling evidence that most of the matter is dark. Um, it, the, before dark energy became fashionable in 1995 or so, um, um, we used to think that universe is made up of matter. We now think it's not, you know, no, it's not. But that's a different story. I'm not going to go into that. But if you just look at the matter in the universe, then um, uh, then we know that about 90% um, of, of all matter in the universe is dark. And the interesting thing is dark matter is not baryonic because we know the number of baryons in the universe. Baryons are things that are made up of quarks, protons and neutrons like us. Um, and we know exactly the number of quarks that was made in the Big Bang. And uh, if you calculate the amount of dark matter that you see around galaxies and in clusters and you add it all up, um, it falls short by a, um, a factor of 10 or so. So as you can see, matter is, um, if you look at the, here, we talk about critical density, but it's not, but it's a total amount of matter, say, then about 10% of it is, is kind of baryonic. And, um, and if you look at just the stars, it's even less. So um, the, the universe is essentially made up of dark matter and, uh, and the amount of uh, matter that you see uh, can be found. I mean, I just gave you two examples. Um, uh, this, for example, uh, can't be explained by Mond because here it's a direct uh, consequence of Einstein's theory, not Newtonian theory. And uh, there are many other ways of, of measuring that matter. Anyway, uh, so I'll stop here. I've covered a lot of ground today. I've covered the basics of astronomy, looking at the sky, met the magnitude system, looking at um, the HR diagram and stars because you need this for future exercises. I've also covered um, galaxies and the evidence of dark matter. So I'll stop there and see whether there are questions. Um, before we take questions, I have one announcement to make for all the workshop participants. Do fill up the Google form linked in the Q&A box. That is your attendance sheet. And yeah, now we can move on to the questions. Yeah. So do I take questions from the Q&A or are you going to give me questions? Yeah, I don't, from the Q&A. I don't see I, it. Okay. The okay. first question is, uh, while measuring the coordinates of stars and distances, don't the stars surrounding us change over a long period of time as our sun and the surrounding stars are moving? So they should change the coordinate system themselves, the coordinates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, that, that is a very good point and, and it does. But uh, human lives are much shorter than that. I mean, we've just only uh, started looking at uh, astronomy uh, you know, through telescopes, etc., in the last 300 years, uh, and uh, um, the really people have been uh, defining such uh, things over the last few thousand years, whereas it takes uh, um, um, much, much longer than that. As I said, the uh, the sun has gone around the galaxy about 20 times in its four and a half billion years. So um, um, the um, so many hundreds of millions of years it takes to go around the galaxy. So that's not the point. The point is actually even um, uh, more interesting, and that is the axis of uh, the the rotational axis of the Earth that precesses. The Earth is precessing like a top, and the precession time scale is twenty six thousand years. So. Um, within the recorded history of astronomy, these things have changed. For example, when the pyramids were being built, which is say five to 6,000 years ago, 
which might be also the, the time scale of the Mahabharata war, for example, in our history. Um, the pole star was not the pole star. Viga was the pole star. And, um, and, and so uh, the sky, the constellations have shifted because the, the sun's uh, precessing. So the, the axis of the rotation of the Earth um, uh, but points at different stars at different points of uh, uh, this this rotation, and that's that's much smaller than uh, the sun going around the galaxy. But uh, yeah, so we are defining this system um, with respect to the Earth and its uh, rotational axis um, as it is now, and that is why it helps to uh, define it with respect to the Earth because we are standing on the Earth, and the sky can change over um, over. Um, thousands of years and of course over millions of years. Yeah, um, can can somebody read out questions? It's yeah. easier. Um, if the curve of mass is measured using neutral hydrogen, then how are we sure that the entire mass follows the same curve as the hydrogen? Yeah, uh, though uh, that's a very interesting question. We are not measuring the mass of the neutral hydrogen though. That's the point. So when we measure the mass of the sun using the uh, uh, say the orbit of a planet. We are using the planet as a test particle and you're measuring the sun. So I don't have a blackboard here, but think about it. If you um, if you, for example, take the gravitational attraction between the sun and the Earth, it's G times the mass of the sun and the mass of the Earth divided by R squared. And you equate it to the centripetal force of the um, Earth due to its circular orbit, and that's mass of the Earth times V squared over R. The mass of the Earth cancels, and you're measuring the mass of the Sun from this exercise, right? So you take a particle of neutral hydrogen, and you find its trajectory in um, the galaxy, and uh, you do the same kind of exercise. You're not measuring the mass of the hydrogen. You're measuring the mass that is causing this hydrogen to move, and that is all the mass that's inside that 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 orbit. And so you're measuring the mass of the galaxy. So it's measuring the mass of everything, stars, dust, gas, and it turns out dark matter because that's what dominates. I hope you understand that. OK, next. What is responsible for the rather significant deviation in the solar spectrum from the expected spectral graph for a black body at 5800 Kelvin for shorter wavelengths of emitted light? OK, I did not talk about this, uh, so this is something you must have um, heard from somewhere. Uh, the deviation um, is because uh, the sun is a black body in the continuum only. Uh, if you look at the continuum, the spectrum has the continuum, which is the shape, general shape of the spectrum, but it also has lines on it. And these are lines which are excitation of certain energy levels, um, uh, uh, certain trans transitions between energy levels, either in absorption or in, um, in emission. Uh, in the sun's spectrum, for example, and this is not true for other things, but in the sun's spectrum, most of the lines are absorption because the outer layers of the sun are um, cooler than the inner layers. And so as light comes out, um, um, sun, the, sun, the, the light gets absorbed. And so there are certain lines where there are more in, in parts of the spectrum where there are more lines, then it would deviate from the continuum, right? So the continuum is fitted. I mean, you can see the, 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 uh, the, the shape of the spectrum. I don't have a picture here. You would see that the general picture, the, the shape of it is a black body and on top there are all these all these lines and there are certain parts of the of the spectrum that there are many lines and if you just focus on that, then you can get a, a lot of deviation. OK. We see objects in the visible range to be red, blue, white, yellow and even in images that are modified RGBs, we can see these colors, but why don't we ever see anything green? That is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we see green. Of course, I'm looking out the window and I'm seeing lovely green leaves on, on trees. Uh, of course, we see green and uh, there are green stars. Um, we call them yellow because uh, uh, what we see, the color that we perceive is a convolution of the response of our eye. 
and um, and the the temperature, uh, uh, the the color of the star due to its temperature, right? And and so um, if a combination of the two uh, gives you a certain color, and uh, actually the the yellow green uh, difference is very small, and uh, and so uh, and uh, uh, and that's also near the peak of our um, our uh, sensitivity of our eye. So the difference between yellow and green is very small. So we, we normally don't call it green, we call it yellow, but it's the same uh, as, as, the, the, as far as the color of the star is concerned. Of course, the, the spectrum is a continuum. So there are stars of, uh, which have a peak in every single part of that spectrum. So uh, it, it is not true to say that there are no green stars. We just call them yellow. Next. Can you explain more about the change of magnitude in different wavelengths or path bands? Um, of course, it will change if you have a spectrum that uh, it varies, uh, um, you know, um, uh, according to wavelength. If you take a particular part of uh, the spectrum, uh, then um, it's going to um, um, be different at different parts. And I showed you the the sensitivities of the different filters. They are centered at different parts of the spectrum and it has a transmission curve that uh, is, uh, is is different from for each. So uh, for a particular star, uh, no star has a flat spectrum so that if you had a spectrum that's completely flat, uh, which is not a Planck curve, then uh, it would look the same in red as in blue, but it doesn't, right? So uh, it will vary according to where um, uh, which filter are you looking at. So the magnitude for a filter is going to be different. And so when you when you talk about the magnitude of a star, you're talking about magnitude in a certain filter. So those Hertzsprung Russell diagrams that I showed you, um, the color of a star comes from the difference between the magnitudes in two filters. And so that gives you the color of the star. And the, um, the y axis is either the magnitude of the star in a certain filter or the integrated magnitude over the entire black blank curve. You can do it both ways. OK, what's next? If everything is on the same plane of ecliptic, then why the objects like Pluto, asteroid Sedna and many other objects that do not belong to the same plane? Uh, can you please elaborate on this from the context of protoplanetary disks formation? Um, yeah, very, very, very nice question. Pluto is not in that plane. As you know, that's why it, it lost. One of the reasons it lost its planetary status is that the Pluto is about 60 degrees away from the plane of the solar system. Uh, everybody else is roughly in the solar system, including the moon around the Earth is uh, is is in that plane, almost in that plane. So at five, you know, varies five degrees of that plane. And Pluto turns out to be completely out. And, uh, and the context of the protoplanetary disk formation is the right context. Um, when the sun um, formed, the planets also formed at the same time. It's the same ball of gas that collapsed to form the sun. And the, the disk around it, uh, which uh, then uh, within the disk, um, and you see this in simulations now, within the disk, blobs of gas coalesced to form the planets and the ones that uh, were terrestrial planets came in towards the center. The gaseous planets stayed on, on the outside. And if you look at that progression going from the terrestrial planets um, like uh, Mars and Earth and, and Venus towards the middle to Jupiter, uh, to Jupiter and Saturn uh, and Uranus and Neptune towards the side, you suddenly come to Pluto which is a, a, a kind of terrestrial uh, planet and which is not even in the um, uh, in the plane of uh, the, uh, the the solar system, which kind of shows that it was captured at a later time, didn't form with the um, the sun. And uh, and this is why uh, one of the reasons why it, 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 it lost its planet status in the end, thinking that it was not really, uh, you know, part of the solar system to begin with. Um, uh, it, the, 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 the plane uh, of the protoplanetary disk and the solar system is, is, uh, is there because of a very similar reason that spiral galaxies have disks. It's that when a, when a ball of gas collapses, it collapses 
perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And, uh, and, and so uh, an angular momentum is conserved. And so um, uh, the rotation, the, the, the rotation increases and becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and in uh, things that are in nature collapsing under gravity, they prefer to collapse in a disk uh, because one of the uh, axes would be weaker than the others in, in this collapse because of the rotation, the rotation sets a certain symmetry, right? And if something doesn't follow that rotational pattern, uh, these would be things that would, would probably be captured later. All right, thanks. Uh, are all the conventions with respect to the Northern Hemisphere and what is the zero of the apparent magnitude scale? I think I showed you, no, there is no zero of the apparent magnitude scale. Um, um, the, the apparent magnitude scale um, is defined in terms of the sun, right? So those, uh, I don't, are my slides still visible? Uh, Darshan, are my slides still visible? I'm sharing slides, aren't I? They are. Now. Yes, they are. yes, yes. So if I go to that uh, um, <clears throat> where I define magnitudes, uh, you would see that um, here. So you can see that um, there is no constant here. I'm defining it uh, in terms of magnitudes. Now, your question is right. If I'm just saying that's a magnitude of a star, then what is the zero point? And you can see it's cleverly done such that the second thing in this uh, thing could be the sun. So I know the intensity due to the sun. That's a solar constant. And so this would be the magnitude of the sun. And so the sun would set the magnitude because we know it very well of the zero point. OK, so uh, we would then find the um, uh, the magnitudes of things uh, in terms of how much brighter or how much fainter they are with respect to the sun. If you want to measure uh, something in an absolute term, then Vega, as I said, is the is the zero point, and that is why Vega is used um, as the zero point in the color scale, which I had somewhere I can't find it anymore. Yeah, so that's there. There, there is a zero point here, and that's that's big. Okay. Right. Um, and uh, do yeah. we have any lead regarding the weird rapid cycle that blue main sequence stars undergo in the lifetime, like the change to yellow and orange joints in between and then back to the normal main sequence? I don't understand that question and I don't I didn't go into all this. Right. I you know that it would take I don't know what what weird cycle you're referring to. But the change in color of a sky of a star in its lifetime, etc. Uh, is the matter of a whole course. Then I'll have to go into the details of uh, um, of of the nuclear um, um, reactions that are involved and the lifetime of a star and 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 stuff like that. Uh, well, come back uh, for a, for a whole course of it, and then uh, well, you know one can understand um, the the migration of a star along in the in the HR diagram. So, how about Einstein's cross? What is its significance? The Einstein cross, I did not mention it, but Einstein cross is uh, uh, is just the um, is is uh, it's not Einstein cross. I showed you an Einstein ring, right? And Einstein cross is just uh, um, uh, a particular uh, system of gravitational lens where there are four um, um, images of the same object, and uh, um, it's very actually um, the number of images that are caused. Um, by gravitational lensing uh, because it's slight misalignment between the lens and the object. Um, the, the Einstein ring breaks up into um, different uh, parts and it breaks up into an odd number of parts. Um, and uh, um, uh, but uh, we don't see often uh, one of them because it, it's hidden behind the lens. And so we see an even number of uh, multiple images. So there are many uh, uh, distant quasars that have double images. There are some that are four images, some that are six images, some that are eight images. I've even seen one with actually eight images. That's the maximum I've seen. So the ones that are four images are often called the Einstein cross. It's not nothing, nothing unusual really. 
what is the linear velocity and radius relation in the case of elliptical galaxies? I didn't talk about this today. I'm not going to talk about this now. Uh, why are orbits of Pluto and Kuiper belt objects highly elliptical? Um, they are. I mean, the ellipticity uh, is defined by initial conditions when the orbit was set up. So um, there is nothing that can change it. So uh, if something was captured from outside uh, and it was already in some kind of a highly elliptical orbit, um, then it stays elliptical. There is no process in the solar system that can change the ellipticity of an orbit. So, um, um, uh, you know, comet orbits are very highly elliptical. Um, Pluto's orbit is more elliptical than other planets, but that's that's just initial conditions. That's how they are. What are your views regarding the different aspects of where gravitational lensing and gravitational micro lensing is used? Right. Um, I, I didn't talk about this today, so I'm not going to comment on this. Micro lensing is a different subject on its own. Micro lensing um, is a, a very uh, small changes in the len lens properties. Lens also means that it doesn't only give you multiple images. In case where you don't um, resolve the images, it changes the brightness. And if you, for example, have um, uh, a star uh, with planets around it and which are moving around it and that causes, that is the lens, then um, uh, you can have small variations in the lensing and that's called micro lensing. There are many, many different reasons of micro lensing. Again, I mean, I, I'd rather stick to the questions that come from the lecture I gave today. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, because then I, I'll have to give you a, a full lecture uh, on, on the on the particular subject. I can't answer questions from all of astronomy today. OK, uh, last question for the day. What is the actual color of the sun if we observe it from outer space? Um, actual color of the sun, if we observe it from outer space, would be the same as we see it. I mean, I, the color of the sun um, doesn't change um, because uh, we are observing it through the atmosphere. Um, yeah, it changes during the day um, from red to yellow, um, uh, depending on where it is uh, in the in the sky because of scattering in the atmosphere. But the general, I mean, when an astronomer measures the color of, uh, of the sun, they measure it uh, by correcting for uh, the atmosphere, etc. Uh, I think the color would be very similar to what you see when it's uh, not very close to the horizon, uh, when it's uh, up in the sky at its maximum. Um, the color is defined by its, uh, its Planck temperature, its black body temperature. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's the same color as you see. Right? All right, no more questions for today. With this, we bring the Q&A session to a close. Uh, we'd like to thank Professor Shoma Rai Chaudhary on behalf of all of us for having taken time out of his busy schedule for this informative session. I believe so has covered quite a lot of useful and essential basics of astronomy. I'd also like to thank the moderators of this session for handling the questions. We thank everyone who has attended today and hope you enjoyed and learned from today's talk. I know it is quite early for a Saturday. In addition, I would like to thank Professor Nirupam Roy and the students of the Joint Astronomy Program uh, for their immense support throughout the process. We are grateful for having a team that has worked tirelessly reaching out to people, putting together the posters, setting up the website and so much more. I'd like to take a moment to thank Team Pravega as a whole for handling so much work so well. I'd like to remind all of you that our next talk is scheduled for today at 3 p.m. where Professor Shivarani Tirupati will continue. She's from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics and she's going to talk about the Milky Way, giving us insights from stellar archaeology. I must mention here that it is mandatory for workshop participants to have attended both the talks today to be able to attend the workshop. 
An announcement will be put up in the Q&A box with links to the next session. So we're looking forward to seeing you all there. Thanks for tuning into this session and we'll see you in the next session. Thank you. Bye for now.